Hello, and welcome to Strathmore's first online workshop series for 2018. My name is Kelly Eddington, and today I'm going to show you how to paint an apple tree in the spring. Whenever I see flowering trees, I think about Vincent van Gogh. His paintings reveal how much he appreciated their beauty. I love them too, and I hope you'll enjoy this watercolor tutorial. I'm using Strathmore's watercolor card paper for this little painting. Since I'll be flooding the paper with quite a bit of water, I'm taping the outside edges of the unfolded card to my board. Cardboard is also fine to use. This will keep the paper from warping. I find that the cards can take a moderate amount of water without using tape though. I'm pressing the tape down in a gentle way, just enough to hold it down, and I'm going in just a fraction of an inch. I've drawn a pencil outline of the scene in the reference photo. It's just a skeleton of the tree. The reference photo and a template of this tree skeleton are available on the instruction sheet you can download from Strathmore's website. Use the template if you wish, but please know that all trees are different and yours doesn't have to look exactly like mine. All right, so most of the projects I'll be presenting here will use masking fluid. Watercolor artists rely on masking fluid to keep parts of their paintings white. In this painting, I'm going to dab the masking fluid everywhere I see the tree's white apple blossoms. I have a brush that's so old all the paint has flaked off it, and I use it to dot masking fluid anywhere I see white. Sometimes my kitten likes to watch me paint, and you might see her head in the videos from time to time. Her name is Pooj, and she is my little queen. Okay, it's kind of hard to see, but I'm actually going to simplify this tree a bit. Where there are more blooms in the reference photo, I'm really going to cluster my dots together, and where there are fewer blooms, I'll leave some gaps for branches to show through. I'm also putting a few tiny dots on the smaller trees to the left, and a few in the grass for dandelions. My masking fluid turns a light yellow as it dries. Make sure you let yours dry completely before moving on. It usually takes about 10 minutes. Finally, we can paint. I'm adding water to some cerulean blue for the sky. I want my sky to be a little bluer than the overcast sky in the reference photo, and I'm painting everything down to the horizon, including the tree. I've added some cyan blue to the cerulean to make the sky more intense. You've got to work kind of quickly and use a fair amount of water and a big brush. A small dryer brush will make your sky look streaky. The masking fluid will resist the paint. Next, I'm putting some yellow and yellow-green in that grassy area. Why do you say we leave the road out of the picture? To this green, I'm adding a few drops of hooker's green, which is darker, and even a little cyan blue, and letting that all blend together. Finally, we've got that middle section to deal with. I like to pump my colors up a bit, so I'm going to emphasize the blue here. I've added ultramarine blue, which is a purplish blue, to what was left of my sky color, and using that to suggest the hills that are way off in the distance. Then I'll put some hooker's green into that color and paint it where I see those trees that are a little closer. As you can see, I've avoided painting the tree trunk, but don't worry if you paint it over it. It's pretty dark. Now I have some time to play around with the colors here. You'll see me add some very dark blue to the background. Watercolors fade as they dry, so if you think your painting is too dark, it most likely is not. If you painted quickly and the paper is extremely wet, you'll probably feel like you've lost control. Sometimes I'll use a paper towel to soak up big pools of paint, but for the most part, if you just back off for a few minutes, the paint will dry a bit and the paper will calm down and you can paint some more. I thought the grassy area was looking a little dull, so I put some bright yellow over the top of it, and I like that bit of cyan blue near the trunk, so I'm going to add a few more drops of it into the background. I'll let it dry while I have lunch. And you can see how the colors have changed here. Time to work on the trunk and the limbs. I'm mixing a dark brown, which is sepia, along with a dark violet color. To warm it up, I'm adding a speck of bright orange, and this is cadmium red light. This is my favorite color. I'm painting it on the trunk with a small number one round brush. The paint is pretty dark, but you can still see the glow of the paper showing through. I've taken care of the vertical part and the big branch that goes to the right. Next, I'm mixing a more intense version of the trunk color, just sepia and violet and way less water. And while that trunk is wet, I'll drop some of it where the trunk is darkest, and it will gradually spread down the trunk. Next is the fun part, establishing the main branches. 
Remember, everywhere you have masking fluid will eventually be white. You can paint over it with this dark color now and it won't affect the white parts later. I can see some of my pencil lines for my tree skeleton and I'm using them as a guide. I've got a number four round brush for this, but you can go smaller if you like, whatever you're comfortable with. Already I feel like it's starting to look like a flowering tree, so that's exciting. Again, I'm simplifying what I'm seeing with this tree. It has thousands of little twigs and branches, so I'm only doing the biggest ones. And if I'm honest, I'm probably making up a few as well. And who's going to know if you do the same? Later on, we'll be filling in some of these gaps with leaves, so don't feel like you have to paint a huge number of branches here. Just get a nice skeleton of lines going and allow them to be broken up by the masking fluid here and there. I'm doing some more work on the trunk and adding a few vague trunks to those apple trees in the distance. Since they're not close to the viewer, I don't have to put as much detail into them and I'll be adding other dark parts soon. Then it's back to the big tree for more minor branches. And for some reason it looks like I've added a little dark green to my branch mix and I'm using that to make a few final branches here and there. Totally optional. I've added some hooker's green and yellow green to my branch color and I'll be using that on the trees in the distance. This will make a general shadowy area along with the undersides of those trees. I'm sort of dabbing it along the edge of the grass in the foreground, and I'm also dotting it in the main parts of the trees to create leaves among the blossoms. I try to have light, medium, and dark values in everything I paint, and something about the addition of those new dark shadows makes the faraway trees look more realistic. Over on the other side, we have some small pine trees. Using that same dark green, I'm adding a few little blobby shapes, instant trees. This also defines the border between the grassy area and the background. Back to the big tree. This is spring, obviously, so I want to paint the baby leaves on the tree a nice yellow-green color to begin with. If you don't have this paint color, you can mix it. Start with a lot of yellow and add green or even blue, just little bits at a time, mixing as you go along. You'll have a pretty spring green a lot sooner than you might think. I'm dotting the green in areas around the branches and the masking fluid blossoms. I like how I'm able to see the sky through parts of this tree, so I don't want to fill up those spaces completely with solid green. That's why I'm using a light touch with the paint and I'll be skipping around from branch to branch. It seems like there are more leaves on the right side of the tree. I've got a small round brush here, looks like a number four, and I'm feeling some intense Vincent van Gogh vibes as I add the leaves. I hope you will too. When I put the masking fluid on, I tried to make blossoms in a variety of shapes and sizes, ranging from larger blobs to specks, with lots of tiny random shaped areas in between. So as I paint the leaves, that paint will go in some of those random areas and hopefully create something that looks really natural. I think randomness is one of the keys to painting things found in nature. Anything too uniform seems mechanical and unnatural. I'm always trying to come up with little tricks that encourage randomness. I felt like the trees on the left could use a hit of yellow, and now that the first round of leaves is done, I'll be adding a few dark green shadows. Just to reiterate, don't worry if your tree and my tree don't match. Relax and just have fun with it. I'm the kind of painter who likes her darks to be really dark, so I've mixed some more of that purplish brown branch color, and I'll paint over the places that I think could use it. There comes a point in most paintings where I feel like it's going to be okay, and we've reached that point. Now I'm having fun coming up with extra branches and trying to get some variety of sizes. A few skinny branches are growing off that big horizontal limb. I think it's nice to have both thin and thick lines. I'll continue fiddling around with this for a bit. The goal of my workshop series was to expose people to a variety of subject matter, such as landscapes, still lifes, and portraits. Which one will you like the most, and which one will you want to explore more in depth? You'll never know until you try a lot of different things. Here's another fun part, removing the masking fluid. Make sure everything is dry first. I'm using a rubber cement pickup to gently lift the fluid from the paper. Its texture always stays at least slightly tacky, and it comes right off, revealing the white paper underneath. If you don't have a rubber cement pickup, an eraser will work too. 
Sometimes I'll put masking fluid over pencil lines I want to save though, and an eraser will erase them, obviously. So I like using this pickup a lot more. I'm pretty careful about getting all of it off, and I'll run my fingers over the surface of the paper to make sure no masking fluid remains. And look at all of this white. It brings the tree to life. Next I'll show you my secret weapon, an old number six round brush whose bristles are destroyed and fuzzing out in every direction. It can make dozens of dots and lines very quickly. I'll mix some green and use this brush to make some very soft and random textures. It will also blur the crisp borders created by the masking fluid. If you don't have an old brush, you can pinch a new brush's bristles to make them fan out temporarily. I've had this brush for over a decade and wouldn't trade it for anything. See how those smaller trees look a lot more complex all of a sudden? I'll use my fuzzy brush sparingly on the big tree as I want to keep most of the white the way it is, but the green specks it's putting down are making me very happy. Now maybe some of you out there are wondering why I went to all this trouble with the masking fluid. Why didn't I just use actual white paint? It would have been a lot easier. And you're right, it would have been a lot easier to go in there like Bob Ross and tap on some white paint with a fan brush. But if you want to paint a truly transparent watercolor, which is what I do, your paper is your white. I enter my work in competitions that have strict rules about this. Opaque white paint is not allowed, so you have to come up with inventive solutions to create those white areas. So I'm continuing to add tiny bits of random green throughout the tree. I don't paint a lot of landscapes. I specialize in portraits and highly detailed still life paintings, and I tend to take small objects and enlarge them many times. I pay a lot of attention to things most people don't notice or care about. So when I am confronted with a landscape or even a single tree like this, I find it overwhelming. There is simply too much for me to take in, and I really have to force myself to edit what I see. So that's hard for me because as a rule, I don't edit. So this tree took me out of my comfort zone and it forced me to loosen up a bit, and that's a very good thing. I'm gonna finish this off with some more tiny sticks and things. This is just me being a detail maniac. You're going to reach a point where you feel like, okay, I'm done. Resist the urge to overwork this tree. I thought about making dandelions in the grass, but I like the white specks the way they are. I'll paint a few little stems and leaves, but nothing too major. Now remember, this is a card, so when you're finished painting it, you could write something in the grassy area, for example, or leave it as it is and put your message inside. Or you could say, I love this little tree of mine and no way am I sending it. Once the painting is dry, carefully remove the tape. I pull it away from the painting instead of toward it. Fold the card and you're done. Or are you? I wanted to see what would happen if I tried to turn this into a magnolia or a redbud tree. I'm mixing a bit of hot pink and magenta together and I'll put it all over my precious white blooms. You could also use a peachy pink color for a crab apple tree or yellow for forsythia, let's say. And this is a fun experiment. I've got to say, I think I prefer the white, but that's just me. Later on, I'll put a bit of violet in this pink and I will use it to create some shadowy areas inside the pink. The pink blurs with the green and the branch color in places, but I think that looks kind of good actually. The cool thing about these Strathmore watercolor cards is they come in a pack of 50, so you can experiment to your heart's content and maybe crank out a whole series of flowering tree cards. Cards that you will keep for yourself with no intention of sending to anyone, probably, but that's your business. I really hope you'll give this project a try, and please feel free to share your work here on Strathmore's website. I'll be very happy to discuss everyone's paintings and help you with any problems. I'm looking forward to seeing what you can do. Please join me for my next workshop in which I'll show you how to paint a handful of shiny gumballs. And there's the finished white tree. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.